Good day, everyone, and welcome to the story behind the stories. I'm Ken Waddell, publisher of the Nipua Banner, Nipua Press, uh, Rivers Banner, and MyWestMan.ca. And I have uh, with me today uh, Owen Devereaux, is our news and sports guy, and uh, he's learning a few new jobs around our place. <laughs> and with uh, also editor Kate Jackman Atkinson. And uh, Kate was away last week, so uh, it was a chance for everybody to learn more things to do. And Owen was really, really pleased with how the week went. The place didn't burn down. I That's a step in the right direction. I was really happy with how it looked when I got back, and maybe should have stayed away longer. <laughs> well, I don't think so. Well, I think just about everybody knows by now that you're going to have a little while, a little later this year when you will be away. Uh, anyway, uh, I guess we haven't told the TV world about your... <laughs> <laughs> You've guessed by now, folks. Anyway, so anyway. Yeah, so I, I get to introduce you, you for our lead-off item today. There you um, go. You did a pretty interesting and topical interview with a with a gentleman. Would you like to tell us about it? Well, I really would, uh, and I hope that people pick up this story uh, not only in the coverage area but across the region and even all across Canada. I uh, was visited uh, not that long ago by Mr. Uh, Richard Leslie, who is about 93, 94 years old. He's a Second War veteran. We don't have a lot of those gentlemen around anymore um, because of age, obviously, but Mr. Leslie is very uh, active, very spry, drives around, came out to see us and told us his story, and he is a good storyteller, but he had a tremendous story to tell. Uh, Second War veteran, he went through um, uh, the invasion at Normandy, uh, occupation of and liberation of uh, Holland, uh, the uh, liberation and occupation of uh, Germany, and stayed in the forces for a while after uh, and came home about a year after the war was over. Um, he was in a lot of battles and nearby a lot of battles and uh, he claims to have lost his hearing uh, as a damage from the, all the noise, artillery, etc. Um, the hearing tests uh, show that. Uh, he made that claim. Veterans Affairs Canada turned him down again and again and again. For, for coverage of his hearing aids. And for a pension, yes. Uh, they had given him a pension because of his hands and feet were badly frozen. Uh, one, the last winter he was in, uh, in uh, Europe. And, uh, but they've refused until about two weeks ago or 10 days ago maybe when um, he went public. Uh, he was interviewed by the Brandon Sun. Uh, we interviewed him as well. The Brandon Sun article, of course, came out earlier because it's a daily paper. And strangely enough, within 48 hours, Mr. Leslie had his hearing aids or promised that he's going to get them and a pension and back pay. And uh, so the story this week is not so much the, you know, the story about his hearing loss. It's it morphs into, like, where were these guys with Veterans Affairs all these years? Why was he turned down? You know, why on earth was he turned down? And uh, my contention, and uh, a lot of people who have dealt with Mr. Leslie and other vets uh, have come to the conclusion that, you know, when a man reaches 90 plus years of age, he's a veteran, he's paid taxes all his life, he's worked all his life, and we can't buy him hearing aids. Uh, there's something wrong with that picture. Uh, I think Veterans Affairs will argue that you know, it's not conclusive that he lost his hearing or that the hearing damage just started to occur when he was in, in the military. But uh, I think that they should err on the side of caution, so to speak, or generosity. And it uh, looks like justice is being done, but it's a shame that a man has to work wait till he's in his mid-90s to receive justice. I, I'm very upset about the whole process. Especially with so few of those veterans left, I can't imagine that it's a huge expense for the, you know, for the government of Canada. I could understand maybe, you know, 30, 40 years ago, that might have been a pretty big, um, you know, that would have been a pretty big expense. But at this point, I think that, um, you know, I think we owe them a little more than that. Well, Mr. Leslie also says that he has a number of friends. He still, uh, uh, does some uh, bit of hunting and he has friends that go hunting with him and uh, uh, some of them, are, they're all military people, all much higher rank than he was, and, uh, but they're more recent um, mm -hmm. service in the military. And they, some of them and, and some of their friends have had uh, compensation for hearing loss and, uh, and Les, Richard Leslie didn't get it. But the thing that really 
put him over the edge, so to speak, was the, you know, he had this sheaf of letters about an inch and a half thick saying no, 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 no. And then the government settled, uh, you know, for ten and a half million dollars with Omar Qatar, um, a uh, convicted terrorist. Uh, some would say that's maybe a little harsh, but that's how I view it. And he got ten and a half million dollars, and um, that just seems excessive compared to the, the the way that they treat our vets. And and I know for a fact that some of the more recent uh, vets, uh, like there's not a whole lot of the Korean War vets left. Um, but the ones from Afghanistan and other uh, peacekeeping and war uh, missions that we've been on as a country have been kind of screwed over. I don't know a politer way to put it than that uh, by Veterans Affairs Canada. And I think it's uh, I don't I don't blame a particular political party because this has been going on for years. I, I think that we need a, a big big shakeup in Veterans Affairs Canada and. Uh, I don't know how to bring it about. You know, the government's always probably, yeah, we're going to do better, we're going to do better, but it seems these stories, horror stories, really keep popping up. You talk about there needing to be a shake-up here, Ken, and you say you're not sure of it. Sometimes when it comes to circumstances like this and agencies like this, I hate to say it, but sometimes it has to be the worst-case scenario has to go out on a public display for action to take place. Perhaps something like this, which has occurred, maybe this is the start of that. Perhaps, as you said, Kate, there aren't that many left veterans from World War II, but perhaps we'll hear some other stories because this, this can't be isolated. I doubt severely that it is isolated. I doubt it too, and I talked to a representative from Veterans Affairs County in Ottawa, and he emailed me back, and I've included his email in the article which is pretty much boilerplate, you know, we will do this, we will do that. Um, but uh, they, he said, well, I won't, I can't comment on a particular case because of confidentiality issues, which I think is BS. This man has gone publicly. There's no confidentiality left at all. Mm -hmm. he, he's given everybody permission yeah. to discuss his story. Uh, but the other thing they said was, uh, he said uh, something kind of telling, and I wrote it in the story, is I won't say that this was a coincidence, he said, which I thought was rather telling. I think somebody read the Pan and Sun on uh, the day that it came out or the day morning after, whatever, and said, oh my God, we better fix something fast. Now, the fix is pretty good. Like, I mean, he's going to get his hearing aids, he's going to get a pension, he's going to get back pay. It's uh, fair. Which is fair, which is fair. You know, it could be argued that maybe the back pay should be a lot further back than it was, but and I, I can't comment because I don't know exactly how far back he's getting back pay on the pension, but uh, it's a good ending to this particular story, but I hope that we never have to write any more of these. And I, I serve warning to Veterans Affairs Canada and any government agency that messes around with our veterans uh, will be on their case. And that was what he had hoped for too, yes. wasn't it? That yeah, he, you sure. know, he got his situation fixed, but he hoped that that it, him make going public with his story would help others facing the same challenges. For sure, because as he said, you know, I can afford to buy the hearing aids. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, he didn't like paying that <laughs> yeah. money for the hearing aids because they're thousands of dollars. Yeah. But, yeah. but he said, I'm not destitute. Yeah. But he says, for other people who can't uh, speak up for mm -hmm. themselves or can't afford it, mm -hmm. he said he wanted to put his case forward. And mm -hmm. so the step one is in place now. Yeah. So. Yeah. On to some maybe happier news. It's always a little difficult to segue <laughs> from something like that into something that is honestly a little more trivial in terms of sports. Uh, gentlemen like that gives us the opportunity to enjoy these trivial type things though. Uh, talking about baseball, the, uh, the Santa Clara Baseball League. Timely sport for this time of year. Yes, <laughs> yes. They uh, recently announced their regular season award winners and there were a pair of Nipawa Cubs who were uh, singled out for some exemplary play that they've had throughout the entire season. Uh, first off, uh, Garrett Rempel, who does, uh, he's one of the main pitchers for them. Uh, he's a fee, he works in, he plays in the field as well, but uh, mainly he's, a, he's an ace pitcher for them. He won the most valuable player, uh, league most valuable player. Uh, he had just an exceptional year. Mm -hmm. um, they don't play as many games as Major League Baseball. Um, I believe it's about 16 regular season games. So he had a, a 541 batting average. 
So that's just a, an amazing average. You don't see that in the majors too often. Sure. Uh, he also had, uh, as a pitcher, 4-0 on the mound. He was a big part of Nipawa's success this year. So it's great to see that uh, he got singled out in this way. Usually, you know, with the success of the Minnedosa Mavericks and the Portage Padres as of late, they usually get all the accolades. So it's, it's nice to see Nipawas getting a little bit of the spotlight as well. And it's been an interesting season, speaking of that, hasn't it? It has. Uh, one other as well, uh, Cole uh, Kirk Kirkowitz, Kirkowitz, I believe. Uh, oh, Kirkavich. Kirkavich, yeah. yes. Young, young man has actually won Rookie of the Year. Wow. Uh, it was his first year with the Cubs. He came in like gangbusters. Uh, uh, 296 batting average, that's a little more human, but it's still a great average for such because this guy he's a kid he's a kid playing among men and you're gonna remember that name for years to come we're gonna be hearing it over and over with the cubs and the ongoing success that this team has he's gonna be a huge part of that so congratulations to him rookie of the year um regular season all this is for regular season we're we're into the playoffs now mm -hmm. and we're gonna be having the santa clara baseball league finals coming up First game is going to be happening uh, this upcoming Friday, depending on, on when you're watching this. But uh, uh, this Friday, it's going to be the Nipawa Cubs, who are going to be hosting a very surprising team. The seventh-ranked Carberry Royals have become a dark horse, the underdog of underdog stories. You're watching the Mighty Duck movies come to life right now in the Santa Clara Baseball League. Uh, they defeated the second-seeded Minnedosa Mavericks, team that's won 11 straight championships, the dynasty, the, the measuring stick of Santa Clara. And then they, in the next round, they defeated the Portage Padres, who are the defending Santa Clara League champions. So it's just amazing to see this scrappy little team just do what nobody honestly thought they were going to do. And it's going to be a very interesting final with these two teams. Exciting for us, both teams within our coverage area as well. It is. Yeah. It should make for a pretty good rivalry. Obviously, Nipawa has friendly rivalries with uh, Minidosa when it comes to, you know, high school hockey and, and baseball, yeah. uh, with Portage when it comes to the Manitoba Junior Hockey League. So it's, it's good to see this sort of thing happening with Carberry as well, a wonderful community. So it's, it'll be fun to sort of bounce back and forth between them and, and watch how this plays out. It's interesting your comment as you worked into that was about uh, from uh, Mr. Leslie because he, uh, he and his uh, compatriots uh, went to war so that we might have the privilege of doing some fun stuff and community stuff. Exactly, yes. We, we can never pay, repay that debt to those, those men and women. Um, I had a column this week was, uh, I, I just wanted to draw attention to the fact with, uh, about the fact that there is an awful lot of money leaves the communities mm -hmm. with our VLTs. And I got looking at that and analyzing it and uh, a friend pointed out to me, and I, I didn't do a full analysis of the money, but, uh, but it's uh, a lot of money goes out of the uh, community. Uh, $57,000 comes back into mm -hmm. Nipawa from BLT revenue to the, to the local government. So God knows how much money must be going out. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, we have a um, situation where we have to, uh, I think, look more closely at how we're doing things locally. And I'm suggesting that the local uh, initiatives of the Chase the Ace at the Nipawa Legion and the Chase the Ace that's being currently held at the Nipawa Golf Club for the Nipawa Natives which this fall will switch back to the Yellowhead Center. There's a lot better way to, uh, if you're gonna spend some money on gambling, uh, it's a lot more fun, there's a social evening to it, and only one and a half percent goes to the government. Whereas, uh, it's you know, a huge percentage uh, do, goes, do goes to. No, I wasn't able to tack that down. Uh, uh, how much percentage, uh, we'll have to do some more work on that. Um, that means probably you'll have to look it up for me because I don't know how, you know, I found these other figures. I good, did that. Good job, Ken. Uh, but um, we're getting you trained up. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was just to uh, hit me that way. But uh, well, the question I have, I'm a little curious about this because you talk about all the money that goes out of the communities on this, and I don't play VLTs myself. 
I don't understand the general concept of why to play BLTs, I, entertainment, whatever it may be. Uh, but most people that play them, I don't think understand the money comes back into the community. It's a self-inflicted tax, really. Yeah, and it just, is. It is. And not much of it comes back to the community. It goes to the government. Yeah. Now, I know the government uses the money to do this and that, and you know, support health care or whatever. But uh, it just seems like, uh, yeah, it's a self-inflicted tax. I, I've heard people describe it even more derogatory terms than that. But uh, yeah, and it doesn't seem to me to be any real social value to it. I mean, you sit in a machine and plug your the crowd is drawn around. Oh you. yeah, it's crazy. I don't think the average person sitting there playing. Uh, I, I, again, I don't even jacks are better or whatever they're called now. I don't think they're thinking. Well, at least I'm I'm losing but at least the money's coming back to the community. I don't think a single one of them's thinking no, that. Yeah. No, 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 it becomes an addiction. Yeah. But anyway, what, uh, you had a little more um, lighter, maybe yeah. better column, yeah, so better column. I don't know if I go that far, Ken, but, well, but last week I had a very well- You're the one that wins all the awards, <laughs> and I don't, so let's get this straight. You're, you are a better columnist than I am. So last week I had a very well-researched, you know, topical, timely, serious column. And I wasn't even here to talk about it uh, on the show. And then this week, I wrote about the holiday that I was on last week. So Tell us a little is, bit. This is holiday. the annual "How I Spent My Summer Holidays" edition <laughs> of, the, of my column. Um, so I went to Newfoundland for last week uh, with my family, and uh, it was very, very cool. I had never been there before, and um, we saw some pretty interesting things. Um, I guess some of the highlights are we saw some icebergs, uh, both on our whale watching tour and just from the shore. We saw some whales, both on our whale watching tour and from the shore. And we also saw some puffins, which were actually kind of one of the coolest animals I've ever seen in a while. And that, <laughs> didn't, that didn't make the cut into the column, but, uh, but secretly that was my highlight of the trip. <laughs> Well, puffin is a bird, Yes, right? it is. Yeah. Um, and Matthew would like to have seen those, right? <laughs> they're about this tall. Like, we're not talking like emperor penguins here. They're about this tall. And they spend eight months of the year floating out in the open ocean, diving for some fish to eat. And then they spend two years, they come to land, and they, uh, you know, they're breeding grounds. And they're the little pufflings, which are what the baby puffins are called. Um, and they, they eat the, the capeling, which are actually the same fish that the whales come up from the Caribbean to eat um, in the summer months. And um, if you've seen those, those lawn, kind of lawn ornaments that look maybe, you know, they've got like wings that fling around like this, you know the ones I'm talking about, yeah, the, yeah. you know, like, yeah. Uh, but anyways, that's exactly what puffins look like when they're flying. They look exactly <laughs> like a lawn ornament. Um, so that was kind of fun. On a more serious note, we saw the um, first confirmed uh, place where Europeans landed in North America, which is at the north end of the island. It's called Lanso Meadows, and it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and the only authenticated uh, Norse settlement in North America. So that was very cool. They came here about 1000 AD. For about 10 years, they used it as an outpost for trading um, for their um, for their inland, um, they brought grapes and lumber back to their settlement in Greenland. Um, so by the sounds of it, I think they wintered there because they would spend the summer coming down from Greenland and then they'd do their trade and then they'd go back. So, That's yeah, cool. Yeah. I was envious because I've always wanted to see that place. It was pretty yeah. cool. And back to hockey. It's got to be hockey in the summertime, Owen. <laughs> Leap One natives are going to have their annual meeting pretty soon. You've done a little bit of a story on that. We are getting close to actual hockey season, so it's, it's going to be interesting. There's going to be a lot of talk about the little bit of game of shinny come the, uh, the winter months here. So um, Leap One natives are going to be having their annual general meeting uh, coming up in early August. It's a little later than some of the other MJHL teams, but you know we always like to dot the I's, cross the T's, make sure everything's officially official. A uh, little bit of good news. Don't want to give away too much of that right now, uh, but we'll be likely talking about that during the next story behind the stories. But uh, I can confirm, and I got this from a reliable source, team president Ken Waddell, that the Nipawan natives will in fact be showing a, a slight profit. They will be uh, one of only three teams in the MJHL that either 
is going to be able to boost a profit, or boast a profit, I should say, or a break even of the 11 teams that are in the league. So uh, there's going to be a lot of other things that they're going to be talking about, some of the financial statements. That's always fun and interesting. But we're going to draw a crowd. Oh, yeah. Numbers always draw people, exactly. Yeah, right. uh, as well, I wish. Re recent player commitments, some of the planned fundraising, uh, sports dinner. Uh, we haven't officially announced who's going to be the representative of the sports dinner, but I'm sure that is going to be coming up as well. Yeah. So it, it should be very intriguing for fans of the hockey team and just people who are committed to the betterment of Nipawa. Sounds good. Uh, oh, actually, I'm oh, sorry. I just for, almost forgot. It's going to be happening on the 9th. It's going to be starting at 730 at the Yellowhead Center. So if you're within the viewing area and you want to come out and learn a little bit more, that's your opportunity. Everyone's welcome, hey? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, the Nipawa Natives are a community-owned team, have been now for 10 years. and. Uh, it's been that a long, hey? that long, yeah, wow. that long, yeah. Now we've got the uh, a chart there that shows the profit and loss every year for the last ten years, and uh, it's pretty nice to see that line going back up above the <laughs> above the red there. So, yeah. anyway, more of a summertime thing: road repairs. Yeah, so what so do you know about road repairs? So if it's summer, it must be both hockey season and road repair season. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm. We did a story to follow up on actually something I believe you two talked about last week, which was the provincial government's announcement of some 50-50 cost sharing for some municipal roads. So I contacted our local municipalities that had project to, projects approved to find out a little bit more about them. Um, I heard back from three, I believe, four, I believe. Um, so. If you want to know a little bit more about the projects, it's in this week's banner. Um, I guess you guys talked about the Kellington Street project last week, which yes, was we Nipawa's one. Yeah. Um, I talked to, well, Owen talked to Mayor DeGroote, and I talked to um, the operations supervisor, Denise Sakay, and uh, they both talked about the fact that this street had had some water and sewer renewal done last year. They were facing a lot of water main breaks, um, some challenges there. So this repaving that street is sort of phase two of, of that renewal project. Um, the municipalities, the rural municipalities of um, North Cypress, Langford and um, Westlake Gladstone had some projects approved, a mix of patching, some grading, um, some uh, road build ups, um, interesting, I talked to Westlake Gladstone Reed, David Single, and he, one of the projects that was sort of interesting that he pointed out was that they were getting some money to continue with their paving in, um, in Plumas, which is not a very big town, but he said over the last 20 years they've been working towards getting all of their streets paved. Um, and so this is another, they're getting another step closer. And, you know, he said with the low speeds and low traffic volumes, they feel that the paving should, should have a pretty long lifespan for them. Um, and it was interesting, he also told me that he will not be running again in the next election. So, oh, really? So there's a little story behind the story. Um, we'll be seeing a new face at the head of the Westlake Gladstone Council yeah. next term. That's an exclusive. <laughs> You've got a very exclusive way right there. I the lead on that one, hey? There you go. <laughs> Well, Owen, I think you, as a strong, strapping young man, will be looking forward to this next news item. The Boston Pizza is going to open soon. <laughs> I'm assuming that you like food. Uh, <laughs> what, what, makes, what makes you say that, here? Ted? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe the microphone is picking up that bass drum sound it's making right now. But There you go. <laughs> used to be a snare, but not so much anymore. No, just a, <laughs> anyway. Used to be a xylophone. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about Boston Pizza. Oh, as everyone knows, the renovations, uh, the construction of the new building has been going along quite well. It looks like it's pretty much done on the exterior, yeah. except for the parking lot area. It, which, uh, sorry, that segues with my story. Um, the repaving of Kellington is actually being done by the same company as doing Boston Pizza. So um, when that Boston Pizza lot's done, the, the Kellington project should probably be repaved too. Oh, good. Then it'll be done quickly and efficiently. That, that'll be nice. Because <laughs> they've done a stand-up job, really, with the, the building itself. It looks, it looks amazing. Uh, some interior work's going on right now. And once the interior work is done, they're going to need some bodies to actually fill the place mm -hmm. and to make some meals and, of course, to get everything out and uh, make sure the patrons are enjoying themselves. It's amazing 
how many people are actually required. You'd think yeah. in a small town mm -hmm. like Nipawa, it would be a small production, but that's not the case. Mm -hmm. They're gonna need 75 people when it comes to uh, cooks, uh, waiters and waitresses, uh, other personnel management, mm -hmm. to get this going, 75 people. That's a huge number. That's that, a significant number when you think about you know, the size of our business. Yep. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. that actually know? makes them one of the larger employers in mm -hmm. the community. So right off the bat, it's a big plus for us. Uh, 75 people needed, obviously you're gonna have to have a job fair. They had two days of uh, a job fair down at the Legion. The um, 20th and 27th, I believe, off the top of my head, is when they had these events going on. They were expecting a decent response, but they were overwhelmed by the numbers that actually came in and were interested in learning a little bit more about the business. When it was all said and done, they ended up having 160 applicants uh, that came in and were looking for a job of, of something, whether it's full-time, whether it's part-time, but it's, it's wonderful to see that the interest that has been generated from it, uh, most likely uh, um, those decisions are being made right now or very soon because they've got to do a lot of training. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a few weeks to get everyone uh, up to speed. Mm -hmm because the opening day is coming very soon. It's that's, that's the number one question I've had people ask me is when, is, when is Boston Pizza opening? So you get to answer that question. We're giving you another exclusive. First the David single and now this. It's going to be opening September 11th. So mark that date on your calendar. There's other reasons to mark that date on your calendar, but this is, a this is one for Nipawa. Uh, September 11th, it's going to be uh, having its grand opening. A little bit of a soft opening, but in terms of big sort of yeah. celebratory things going on, it's going to be the 11th. It, oh. it should be a lot of fun. It, talking about the number of jobs, and the nice thing about that is that a lot of the jobs in our community are fairly set hours, you know, 9 to 5, Monday to yeah. Friday, so this will offer a nice opportunity for people who are either looking to supplement existing jobs or students who need who obviously can't work during those times, so this will be really great for the community. It's a nice mix of full-time and part-time, so it should work rather well. Owen, you, uh, I think, have a bit of an update on another story, the walking path. What's, what's happening there? That's right. Uh, I actually should give credit where credit is due as well. Uh, Kira ended up doing the update on the Boston Pizza. She also ended up doing the update on the walking path. Uh, Kira... Didn't, didn't Jessica do the Boston Pizza story? Oh, yes, you're right. I'm sorry. Put you on the spot there. Young people, they're <laughs> interchangeable, you know. <laughs> they sit beside each other. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you, Kate, that uh, Jessica did assist with the Boston pizza. I, I should give credit, as I said, where credit is due. Give it to the right person. That's exactly. The but Kira did the work on the walking path. I'm just the messenger. Uh, walking path in the flats. A lot of people in the town have been curious about it. They've seen this giant concrete structure just sort of sitting there on the, uh, the corner of the flats where the walking track is now. A little wondering what's going on with that. It's, a, it's a, a wall that they've put up around there sort of to commemorate Canada's 150th. Um, not done yet. There's still a uh, railing that needs to be put up because it's not exactly safe right now. Uh, once they put the railing up, they're getting it specially made right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's going to be arriving shortly, and that'll sort of be the official completion of this little endeavor that they received funding from, from the federal government. So it was a 50-50 split on that. That's pretty cool. What about, uh, I think we have to pretty much close up here, but we got time to maybe talk a little bit, to Kate, about the mental health walk. Yeah, um, so this is a, actually a story that Kira also wrote. Um, so what were we doing at all this <laughs> week? We were just sitting around, weren't we? <laughs> Pretty um, much. I was on holidays for half of this production cycle. I don't know what your excuse is. I'm just lazy. <laughs> um, so, so um, on a more serious note, I believe it was five community members banded together to organize this event after a, a bit of a tragedy. Um, and so they're hoping to hold some events. The first one will be this walk on August 20th. They have uh, multiple different distances and they also have a walk and a run. So it's um, really, it's open to anyone who wants to participate. There is something that you can do. And if you don't actually wanna lace up your walking or running shoes and hit, hit the track, 
they're looking for volunteers to help as spotters who would basically, um, you know, provide directions or assistance to the participants. Um, they are also having uh, a comedian, Big Daddy Taz, who is very funny. I've seen him a couple of times. Um, and, but he does, he has bipolar disorder, so some of his routines do involve mental health. So the, the comedy portion is for free for the, for the participants in the run. Um, community members can also attend, but they're asking for a small donation, which I think would be well worth your money to see. It should be a good show. Um, and that's August 20th. And for more information, there's some info, there is more information on the Town of Nipois website, or you can contact Diane Martin. Well, we didn't finish our whole list this week for sure, but if you uh, look at the Nipois banner, Nipois Press, you'll see items about the Kelwood Fair coming up, the, uh, the Harvest Sun Music Festival, the Clear Lake Days, Carberry Heritage Fair, and we didn't even get a chance to talk today about the car show or the drag races or the Lily Days. Maybe we'll be able to squeeze them in next week. But uh, If you want to know about them, you could pick up either of our papers this week. Exactly. They're well covered in the papers, and we hope you do enjoy that. So thank you for being with us for the story behind the stories, and we look forward to your feedback to us, and uh, we uh, look forward to being with you again next week. Thank you.